Welcome back all, welcome back all, welcome back all to the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. This is one of the many podcasts you can find from Inside Carolina covering all things Tar Heels and just about any appetite you might have for football, basketball, recruiting, or whatever, you can find it on InsideCarolina.com. So take a second, stop, rate us, review us, subscribe if you haven't. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel. However you're getting this content, make sure you subscribe so that you get it automatically. We're going to make it easy for you to consume all of the content that you wish. I'm Joey Powell, with you as always, and with me as always, my two main men, the two guys that bring the heat every week on this podcast, the insight, the analysis, whatever it is that you're hangering for, these guys can deliver. Sean Moran, Sherelle McMillan, that's easy for me to say. Sean, how you doing, man? Uh, Doing well. Um, as well as can be after watching that Florida State game. Hey, man, a lot to be a lot to be proud of. We'll get to that in a second. Sherelle, fruit snacks and gays, you all right? Fruit snacks and cold, so we're ready for a podcast. All right, that's 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 good to hear, boys. As we get rolling, want to make sure we give a shout out to our friends over at Johnny T Shirt and Johnny T Shirt dot com. Great people in Chapel Hill on Franklin Street have been taking care of the Inside Carolina community for quite some time, and we want to make sure we just pay it back. Spend some money with them, hit them up, any paraphernalia, memorabilia, goods, uh, whatever you need with the UNC logo on it, they got it for you. And like I've said before, if they don't have it, you don't need it. JohnnyT-shirt.com, great prices, quick shipping, you name it. Local company, been around forever. Make sure you take care of them. Inside Carolina Premium subscribers have the extra 10% off the top. Use that on top of their already great prices. And thanks to Johnny T-Shirt. Fellas, recruiting-wise, not a lot to talk about. Uh, I will mention as a follow-up service to our listeners, uh, the Caleb Mills flirtation is over with. Sherelle, you want to kind of put a bow on that so we can move on down the road? Yeah, I would say that it's very similar to Quincy Roche, who was a football player from Temple who wanted to transfer to North Carolina last year, and North Carolina didn't have a scholarship available. He ended up at Miami. I think a very similar situation at UNC this year. Uh, Mills did also want an opportunity to be the guy at lead guard, so that was probably more um, a factor in his decision than we realized. But you called it a flirtation because I think that's right. People have to realize UNC hasn't taken a uh, traditional scholarship transfer under Roe Williams at all during his entire time. Um, and a lot of times what happens is they make a call, they kind of gauge interest, and then it doesn't go anywhere from there. And that we've seen that with Trey Wirtz. We saw it with uh, Trevor Lacey. We saw it with Alex Oriaki back in the day. <clears throat> I mean, we saw it again with Caleb Mills. So uh, I, I think mid-semester transfers aren't something, traditional transfers are something that Roe Williams doesn't do really at all. Um, mid-semester or, or spring semester transfer would, would have been, um, even more surprising for him to do. And again, they didn't have a scholarship. Yeah, I think even if you take the scholarship notion out of the way, uh, you're looking at really kind of upsetting an apple cart in a season that's already weird with regard to building a dynamic and a team cohesion that, uh, you know, and if we know anything else about Roy Williams, he's a creature of habit. So I can't see to where a guy who likes to build relationships and a guy who is who we've all said is, is stubborn in his ways by his own admission, uh, it doesn't really shock me that he stuck to his guns and and uh, continued with nothing uh, in this situation. But we appreciate you giving some some insight on that. Uh, guys, let's move on towards talking about some games this past week, and one of which was was more recent than the other. But I want to go back to the Syracuse game because I think we mentioned on this show last time that that Syracuse game may have been some really good timing for this team, not necessarily from a get right game that they're going to win by 20 or 30, but that playing against a zone might give them some opportunities. Sean, what did you feel like the team gleaned from a, a playing a game against a Syracuse team that typically, you know, plays the zone that Jim Beheim is known for, but may not have the, uh, may not have the athletes that the good Syracuse teams have had. Well, I think the main thing was, was turnovers. Um, you know, I think, for the UNC guards, we knew that they weren't going to be, you know, Syracuse, Syracuse's defense wasn't going to be up on the guards as soon as they crossed half court. So we thought it would be a little easier and they'd have a little more freedom, um, you know, in, in terms of not getting pressured and only having 11 turnovers. Um, and then the other thing was really RJ Davis, who in both Syracuse and Florida State played extremely well, uh, turned around. I think he had a 27 offensive rating against Miami. 
and and has played significantly, uh, you know, significantly turned around his game the past two times. Um, you know, did it help that he was playing against some guys that he was a little more familiar with up in the New York area, perhaps? But I think those were two things. And then, you know, I guess the other thing was just, you know, Garrison Brooks, um, some of the, the his play, um, I think, against Syracuse, him just kind of going into that middle of the zone. Um, and at the same time, his passing, um, I think both games we saw him, you know, it looked like, you know, he was making, you know, not Dayron Sharp quick, quick decisions, but he was making pretty quick passes and pretty quick decisions in both of those games. Yeah, he was decisive. I think that's a great point. I don't want to get in. I uh, don't want to get full on into uh, Garrow being back yet, but I do want to point out that that post production that you mentioned, Sherelle, How can North Carolina maintain uh, a basic level of post production, especially when it seems like one night it's it's Brooks, one night it's Baycott, one night it's it's Sharp. Um, what can UNC do to to kind of level off that so that it's not so feast or famine? Uh, I think they have to not forget about it. Um, sometimes their guards go through stretches where I think um, they maybe have hit a shot or two and they start feeling good about themselves, which is which is what you want. You want your guards to be confident, but there shouldn't be a single possession this entire season where one of the bigs doesn't touch the ball in the painted area. Um, just because the bigs have shown that uh, once they get down there, they can score. And they've shown that sometimes they get fouled and they've shown that they're excellent weak side rebounders as well. <clears throat> so the same thing we've been talking about, about how important offensive rebounding is for UNC. So I think, you know, you don't want to force feed, but you want to make sure kind of the, the uh, you remember the Randy ratio with Randy Moss? Yeah. It was basically like, I can't remember. Mike Tice came up with it. Like 65% of all passes had to be thrown Randy Moss's way or something like that. You know, 75, 80, 85 possessions, North Carolina has to have a paint touch no matter what, just because it makes things so much easier for everybody else. So I would say commitment to it and not forgetting about it by um, especially the freshman guards, but all of the guards on the roster. Yeah, I think the entry passes have been tough. I mean, if you look, the guy that's best at making an entry right now is either if it's not Dayron Sharp, it's Leaky Black. And I, I think that it's it's been a struggle for the guards, especially against a team like Syracuse, where your exploitation is going to be starting at the high post and kicking it to to a baseline or reversing it for a wing. And, um, and the other thing, Joey, I would say, too, yeah. the bigs have to do a better job of finishing. Yeah. Um, part of the reason that it seems feast or famine is because, you know, I, I, I can't talk. I'm five, eight and a half on a good day standing mm -hmm. on my tippy toes. But you're 6'10", 220, 6'11", 240. 7 1 2 40. You be need strong. to be able to finish. Yeah, you got to be yeah. strong. You got to, even if you can't go through contact yet, you have to make sure there is contact so you at least get to the free throw line. And I think too often, Carolina's bigs, I'm not saying they're shying away from contact, they just don't go up forcefully enough, I think, um, sometimes. And it could be, I don't know, it could be fatigue. It, it could be uh, not wanting to get offensive fouls. I don't know what it is, but it's just something that all four of the bigs need to improve on. Absolutely. Uh, you touched on something there that I want to throw to Sean about UNC's guards starting to kind of feel themselves. Um, Kerwin Walton has actually has absolutely become a bucket. Uh, and I think in the most recent game against Florida State, you saw R.J. Davis, I think, led the team in scoring. <laughs> Caleb Love, while he took 10 shots, is starting to hit and is starting to, I guess, at least shoot in rhythm. Sean, what does that mean? I mean, you've been the guy, I think, that's – it's always, what, six threes you want from this team, right? I mean, <laughs> they got 10 against Florida State. Granted, it was a higher volume, but uh, how can they continue to work things inside out but still allow themselves to get their feet under them from, from the perimeter? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I was, I've been saying six for a while, and I, really that was their ceiling early on, and I think with Kerwin's – his increased playing time and him continuing to knock down shots that that ceiling has obviously increased. Um, you know, I think in ACC play outside of that first game against NC state. And then, uh, you know, they had a pretty poor shooting game against Syracuse, but they had 10 against Florida state and every other game, you know, seven, eight, nine, three. So they've definitely shown that they're now kind of above that mark. Um, I think, you know, we'll, we'll probably touch on it shortly, but Anthony Harris as well. Um, and I think the ceiling is, is definitely much greater than it was just from a shooting perspective. Um, I think you need the threes and the outside shooting to one, just kind of keep up and, and have a semi-decent offense, but ideally you can kind of find the balance where 
you're, you know, you're a threat from the outside and now you're opening up, opening up space, but still being able to hit the bigs and not forget about them, uh, which I think, you know, is, is really the key thing. And even against Florida State, I felt a lot of the time Florida State was switching and the UNC post players just weren't offering up a good passing angle yeah. at times. But now at times the guards weren't throwing good passes, so it kind of works both ways. But in terms of three-point shooting, I mean, crowen has been, been shooting, you know, shooting the lights out from three, especially when he's open or has his feet set. Um, you know, RJ, is he starting to turn it around? Perhaps, you know, hopefully him and him and Caleb are getting a little more comfortable. Um, and then you throw in Anthony Harris. So I think, you know, I was saying six, I'll have to kind of come up with a new number, but it is nice to at least, you know, in spurt, see them being able to contribute from beyond the arc. It was neat to see against Florida State just, and, and we've talked about it here, and it just makes sense that this would be the next evolution, but having that threat from the outside does open up so much more spacing. I would love to see the perimeter guards or guys on the perimeter, whether they're guards or otherwise, be able to use uh, that spacing a little more in UNC's advantage towards getting entry passes. But if nothing else, if the announcers are on to the fact that Kerwin Walton's a shooter, then you know he's on people's scouting reports, right? Because the announcers are usually last to get, to get anything and figure anything out. So the fact that they're on it. Sherelle, when Sean mentions Anthony Harris, I don't think Tar Heel fans or really anybody <laughs> expected to get offensive production out of him. And today, he, or, or against Florida State, he jumped in and not only gave energy and brought some a little bit of verve to the game, but he actually came out and, and brought some offense too. How, how do you think – he works into the rotation moving forward and, and what can we expect him to give from an offensive standpoint uh, in, in games, or is it just going to be defense? Uh, I mean, if I was him, I would retire like the best five games, <laughs> the best five games. Yeah. Just like, it can't get any better. Like this is the no mountaintop one, we're done. No one, no one knows any of your flaws. Like you're, you're perfect. Just declare tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, but seriously, I, you know, I think um, before the season, we thought that healthy, he probably would have been the starting two guard. Uh, so I think he bleeds into Playtex minutes a good deal. I think um, Playtex minutes will go down as Harris's start to go up a little bit. Um, I think, you know, his high school coach told us, he, I, I asked him, I said, this is maybe a year and a half ago. I said, you know, everybody knows Ann is the defensive guy, the intensity guy. I was like, do you think he'll be able to, you know, make enough shots in college? And he was like, what are you talking about? He shot 42, 43% from high school. Now, a lot of people shoot 41, 42 percent from high school. But <clears throat> as we start to see him play more, I think he's competent enough where he's not going to be in the mid 20s or anything. And, you know, you just have to be competent with this UNC team. Um, so I think he can bring offense. I wouldn't count on him for two threes a game or anything like that. Right. Um, but, you know, I think he can hit an open one from the corner when he needs to. And like you said, the verb, the energy, just I, I don't know if it's just him. Because in all the games he's played, only even though it's only been five over two years, it's been like that. Or if they were just so excited to see him out there and so happy for him, and he hmm. was playing so hard that it just kind of, um, you know, reverberated with everybody. I, it's hard to tell. Uh, my only thing about about Harris, and it's fine to get excited, but I think Carolina, the the coaching staff, and Anthony Harris himself have to fight against themselves a little bit because you have to control his minutes. You cannot. Yeah. You can't throw him out there 15, 20 minutes a game, even though he might be playing really well. They have to fight themselves on that just because he is coming off two very serious knee injuries. Um, so there, I'm sure there's conversations about that, uh, but maybe it's good for him. If he only plays that 10 minutes a game, he can go 100, you know, 120% mm -hmm. as opposed to going, you know, 100% for 15 or whatever. Um, so I think that's something to watch. It's just they have to, it's going to be very easy because he's playing so well to, to yeah. keep him in the game, but they have to fight themselves on that. Well, there's something to be said, too, for having those fresh legs for 10 minutes. And, you know, I do think that Doug Halverson will have some uh, – will have a, a giant red light that he can flash whenever we're getting around that minute mark. But to your point, I mean, when he hit that corner three today against Chichen Itza or Coach's Pizza or whatever his name was, like that that was that was a real pretty stroke. And he did it with a seven-footer flying at his face and didn't hesitate. And you, you just – you feel so good for a kid like that that can come off of the injuries that he's had to the magnitude that he's had them and can just really lose himself in a game so quickly. Uh, Sean, I want to ask you, you know, Sherelle kind of talked about not really expecting a lot offensively from Anthony Harris and how he might affect the, might affect the rotation uh, as far as, you know, the two guard goes. What do you think he brings to a team if you can actually have 
another defender out there with how he might take some pressure off of a kid like Caleb Love? Well, you know, I think, you know, for me, I'd say I'm more of a pessimist than an optimist, but when, when he came in, I had to do a double take and I'm, I'm definitely pretty excited about what he can bring to the team, you know, whether it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I think I'll get to the defense in a second, but let's just stay offensively, obviously hit the three, but I think there's a few other key things that stuck out one uh, when he, when he uh, caught the ball on the right, right side, dribbled left and sucked the defense in the team doesn't really have kind of anybody that has been able to penetrate and yeah. draw the defense in and then be able to kick out to more of an open shooter. So one, just kind of that athleticism on offense. And then two, the fast break, uh, he was able to finish, finish a fast break. And I think UNC has struggled so much on just running a simple two on one, three on two <laughs> fast break. I mean, that was one of the, the big turning points was the play tech fast break to the MJ Walker fast break and kind of a five point, five point swing. So I think, you know, just, watching him he's a he's a real basketball player in terms of what he brings and that's that's exciting um i think also it can help some of the minute you know the minute distribution given just how weak the wing has been this year um but in terms of defense you know i think it was two possessions where uh florida state you know turned the ball or you know got called for fouls just because of what he was you know on the on ball pressure um i think athletically once again it gives somebody it gives you and see a guy that can get into whether it's a point guard or a, a good wing and he's strong enough and quick enough to be able to frustrate pretty much anybody. And now all of a sudden if you're going against that team with an elite wing, you're not, you know, scared of defending him up, up tight. So once again, I think just his nature as well as kind of his energy and how hard he plays, I think will bring a lot to the team, but once again, not expecting all of that to happen immediately but I think him being worked in will will just be once again a benefit and hopefully continue to slightly raise the ceiling of this team on both sides of the ball all right so before we we look forward uh we saw some improvement from this team over the last couple of games it's it's been marginal but it's been improvement and I think that's something that you know we've all kind of predicted and have seen little flashes of uh whether it was cutting down on turnovers I know they had some live ball turnovers that turned into quick baskets against Florida State, but overall, their you know their turnovers turnover numbers have come down. Uh, I, I do think the perimeter shooting has obviously gone up. I think their spacing has gotten better. What are some things that you guys think that the team needs to continue to improve on uh, in this next week to really kind of start, I guess, getting over the hump and, and starting to kind of cement themselves as a top half of the league team this year? Jarrell, I'll go to you first. Um, my immediate thought goes to on the ball defense. I think there are just too many times uh, where players have open runs to the basket. <clears throat> it didn't happen as much today. Um, and I, you know, I, I hate to um, talk about UNC's performance, but it should be viewed through the lens that Florida State was missing its best player. Right. Um, you know, and their facilitator. And their facilitator. Like, so we're, we're talking about how good they played and they played within five against a, a really great team. But, you know, keep that in mind as well. Um, but I, really I like a to great see, team. Uh, a good team, a, a good team, a good team, <laughs> uh, with potential to be a great team. Let's put it that way. Um, so, uh, yeah, on the ball, on the ball pressure, I think is something that can really improve. And then, um, the bigs, uh, we've talked about how they play, um, the pick and roll and how they hedge and, and all those things. And I think too many times, uh, it's not even that they're not athletic enough to come with some of these players going downhill, like gray, some of the, the stretch fours or, or whatever you would call them, the hybrid forwards. Uh, it's that they're just taking bad angles and they're not moving their feet quick enough. It's not, that they're not capable of moving their feet quick enough. It's just that they're not doing it. So more t- attention to detail there. Um, and then like we talked about earlier, just make sure that there's paint touches every possession. It opens everything up. It helps Kerwin. It helps Caleb. It helps RJ. It helps whoever's going to shoot. And then it helps the bigs as well um, because they're great. I shouldn't say great. Sean, take, <laughs> uh, taking, uh, taking exception to the adjectives that I'm using. They're good <laughs> passers, especially in the interior. Um, and so if, if you're able to get the ball in the paint, then good things happen from cutters, from we talked about it, offensive rebounds, all those things. So on the ball defense, um, the bigs uh, on sc- coming off screens and hedging, and then uh, making sure there are paint touches, I think are three areas that if they improve upon, they'll, they'll keep getting better. 
Sean, your umbrage with uh, Shrill's choice of words aside, I would ask you the same question. And you don't have to give me three things, but what are some things this team can still improve upon? Or is that a place now where maybe they couldn't improve on them a few weeks ago because there were other priorities? But what are some things you'd like to see uh, show up in the next in the next week that that could really take them to the next level? Yeah, I mean, they've definitely, I think, been getting better offensively, especially after that, that Miami game. Um, you know, I think, one, you're, we've already seen it in terms, of especially the freshmen, you know, the, the teams are, they know how to, you know, they know what Kerwin is really good, good at. Um, they know Dayron is going to go over his left shoulder every time he touches the ball in the post. Um, so are the, especially the young guys, are they able to adapt um, to that? And are they able to either continue, you know, in Kerwin's level playing at a high level or, you know, Sharp, you know, right now he's still playing with a lot of energy, crushing the boards, but, you know, some of the turnovers are missed shots. Can he, can he kind of pick that up? And then, you know, as Sherelle mentioned, just kind of the attention to detail, I think you're seeing them be able to go on runs more, which is helpful. Um, but at the same time, you know, against Florida State, they did, a f you know, two things really well, then all of a sudden just give it right <laughs> give back, it back, except, you know, three things they just did wrong. And now you're, you're still in a hole. So I think, you know, once again, it's, there, there's improvement. Um, luckily, I think the only reason I, I questioned Sherelle's additive choice was a comment I, I made in our Slack chat earlier is that as a resident Big Ten hater in this, in this group, that the ACC is basically the, the Big Ten now in terms of no tempo and just a lack of quality teams. A lot of um, plotting basketball too. And, you know, that is good for UNC in one way and there should, should be, a, you know, some wins in that schedule. But, um, you know, hopefully – they can have that focus with a Wake Forest or NC State team they already lost to, be able to get some of those wins, which they had been doing, and then, you know, hopefully be able to pick off a win or two against, you know, that quote-unquote top tier of the, of the conference. Is Clipson in that top tier with, with what happened to them on Saturday? They, they were prior to, to, to Saturday, yes. <laughs> I think it's UVA. U, I mean, UVA is the top tier, which they're, is, I mean, they're, you know, you put them – basically there's no top – 15 team in the ACC and UVA I told is the top you guys, tier. Which... Nobody's any good. Yeah. It's Gonzaga. I'm starting to be a believer in <laughs> Baylor, but nobody's any good. Like everybody can go out and get waxed on any given night. Yeah. Um, so Sean, you, you touched on the look ahead for the Tar Heels. I'll keep it with you. Uh, how do you feel the Tar Heels prospects are with this week's game? Uh, assuming COVID doesn't wreak havoc here because, you know, NC State just had another, uh, another breakout on their team, but how do you assume the Tar Heels' fortunes will look against a Wake Forest team that is 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 found themselves and I think is a little more uh, is a little tougher of a squad than Danny Manning had, uh, and then you know, as you alluded the the rematch against NC State. Well, one I think it's you know two games that they you know they they need to go two and zero. Obviously, Wake Forest is a is a must win. Um, you know that Wake Forest has been, I think playing a little harder than they had with Manning, but in terms of, of talent and size, it's probably the only, I think only game that UNC is going to be favored by double digits going forward. Um, now, does that, what does that mean? You know, nothing really. We saw that with Notre Dame, but once again, I think um, with Wake Forest, if they're focused and, and, you know, what, the one thing about Florida State is at least at the beginning, they came out with some energy and you saw that I think from the team on the court, from the, the coaches, from the bench, right off the bat. Um, and I think they're going to have to, you know, stay focused throughout the game. And then NC State, once again, um, you know, they had a great almost comeback against them, but they let NC State do any, whatever they wanted to offensively. You're not going to have that crowd. Uh, NC State still has a lot of quality, you know, decent to quality basketball players. So can they continue, um, you know, to shoot the ball well like they did against Florida State, but now can they – continue to see kind of a good, a, you know, good post play with Garrison Brooks having two game, two good games. And then, you know, you're getting a, you're getting efficient performances from Armando. Um, but we'd love to see him just kind of have a dominant one against one of these uh, against Blake Forrest or NC state. Yeah. He only had 17 minutes against Florida state. I agree with you there. You got to find a way to, to get him some more, uh, some more touches. And I don't know if it's, if it was foul trouble, the reason the staff was holding him out or, or just trying to keep fresh bodies on Florida State's length. Sherelle, I'll come to you and we'll wrap the show. What are your prospects, at least in your mind, for this week against uh, against two old 
uh, big four tobacco road rivalry games in Wake Forest and NC State. Yeah, I, I agree with Sean that they need to go 2-0. and I'm not going to say that they won't make the NCAA tournament if they don't, but uh, it would help their prospects a ton. And uh, I think this is why people sometimes, you know, freak out, for lack of a better phrase, when they lose games like Georgia Tech, especially, oh, when, they were up, especially sure. when they were up double digits, yeah. because you, you shrink your margin for error later on in the season. You know, I don't think anyone expected UNC before the season – within the last two weeks or the last month to go into Florida state who has a 19 game ACC winning streak and win. Um, but when you lose that game, like you expect, and then you lose one like Georgia tech that you don't, you know, it's just, it adds another loss. Now you've got five um, <clears throat> and just makes it that much harder to kind of climb out of things. So you have to take care of business against teams that you are uh, more talented than or equally, equally talented too. And I think Wake Forest and NC state both meet that description. Uh, I think they probably will have learned a good deal if the NC State game happens um, from that first game uh, as far as just their advantage inside and not taking so many rush shots. I think that was the difference in that NC State game in Raleigh was that the guards were just – we thought it might help calm them down, but they were a little out of control. And also I didn't think, play defense. But yes, They didn't, they didn't play defense. That's true. <laughs> but I think, you know, a few weeks later, I, I think it's easy to see the growth from them from that game. Even if it's not pretty or great, you can definitely see growth from those two mm -hmm. um, since then. Curran Walton now is more of a factor than he was in that first game. And then Wake Forest really, you know, they – that that's a classic uh roy williams we were just a little more talented in the press conference we <laughs> were more went. gifted than they were yeah that's that's the that could be a classic one of those but you know we talked about it i don't think you can just assume that carolina is going to be anyone by double digits because yeah. yep. their margin for error is just small this year and it's not going to change the announcers were like carolina's law you know all six of their acc games have been within six points and on Wednesday, it'll be all six of their have been within seven points. And then I don't know, it, Wake Forest will probably come close to that because um, Carolina just doesn't have um, the traditional it that it usually has to blow people away and score 95 points and win by 30. I'm not saying they won't win convincingly or they won't win the game, uh, but just people expecting like, oh, it's Wake Forest. They they beat Catawba and they've lost the rest of their games. They beat Longwood or whoever. Why are you um, making on Delaware State, man? <laughs> <laughs> so like just people expecting that, that Wake's are just going to roll over. That's not going to happen. Um, so don't be upset if it's a five, eight point game at the under four timeout or anything. You know, this is the ACC and teams are going to play. It's still Carolina. Teams are going to play above their yeah. head a little bit. So that would be my advice. Uh, they need to go 2-0. and If they don't, it's not the end of the season. But uh, if they lose one of these games, it's the, the road to the NCAA tournament starts to look tougher and tougher. Well, boys, as always, appreciate the look at things. Uh, it will be interesting to see if the team can continue their upward trajectory that we have seen over the last few performances, independent of the loss against against Florida State, which I still would say, without Scotty Barnes, uh, the team still played better. And, you know, I appreciate that the three of us, if nothing else, can look at the game and recognize that it's not played in a vacuum, that the other team does have a say in the in the result, and the other team's talent does have a an affect on what happens on the scoreboard at the end of the ballgame. But Guys, always appreciate you bringing your A-games. Always appreciate the insight and the thought that you bring to this podcast. Uh, as for everybody listening and or watching, we appreciate you being here. Special shout out once again to Johnny T-Shirt for sponsoring. Uh, we hope you guys will continue to listen and consume all that Inside Carolina puts out there. You can read a scoop from Sherelle every week on the Inside Carolina premium message boards. Uh, Sean will have some more uh, player analyses coming up in the near future. So look for those. And we'll be back with you next week, as always, here on Coast to Coast Podcast on InsideCarolina.com. For Sherelle McMillan, for Sean Moran, I'm Joey Powell. We'll catch you guys next time. Late.